Are you, are you coming to the tree with a strong upper man? The same murder three. Strange things that I've been hearing, a stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree? Back in 1776, someone said, Give me coffee or give me death. And if that's how you feel, you should be at the Organic Man Coffee Track. They make coffee the right way, one delicious cup at a time. 4501 McPherson, Suite Number 9. Coffee, the stuff dreams are made of. And welcome to the show. I'm your host, Chris James. Here are some more stories to make this season memorable. A few of these scary stories I was able to find on the internet. Others I heard from folks that it actually happened to. Once more, some of these folks didn't want their names mentioned due to not wanting people to know they had a weird encounter. They say if you see things, you might be crazy. I think if you see things and you don't talk about it, you might be crazy, but, well, that's me. I assigned each person a name to make the stories easier to follow. Without a name, it just sounds weird. The person who saw it, the person who said it, eh, you give them a name, it kind of adds a face to the body. The names might not be theirs, but the stories are. Donna was stationed in Guantanamo Bay in 2011, when she was 19. She lived in a two-story duplex with five other girls. It had two bathrooms. With seniority in all the others in the house, when a room opened up with its own bathroom, Donna called dibs. Even though the room did have two beds, she wanted the room to herself and, well, none of the other girls seemed to have an issue with it. So she took the whole room. She placed her ruck, that's the bag you carry, rucksack, and her uniform she was going to use the next day on one bed. And the other bed was pushed up against the wall so she could sleep facing the room. After falling asleep, She awoke with her back to the room, which was unusual because when Donna had fallen asleep, she'd been pretty much dead to the world and should have stayed in one position. She had that weird feeling she was being watched. Instead of feeling on edge, she actually felt very relaxed. If you've ever had to sleep in a room with as many as 30 roommates, You get used to having people around when you sleep. The military used barracks where you have a bed and a footlocker, and that's your personal space. Once you get to a duty station, you might get a smaller room with fewer folks around. If you have rank, you get the best room available. Adana sat up and turned around to see who was in the room with her. There was a blonde man in a black cloak sitting on the bed. All of her gear was now laying on the floor. Donna said this guy was incredibly good-looking, but his eyes were completely black. She remembers they had a long conversation. She knows this happened. However, she can't remember what they talked about. At the end of their discussion, the blonde man told Donna to go back to sleep. So she did. When she woke, Donna remembered the nighttime visitor. It felt more like a dream up until she noticed that all of her gear was laying on the floor. She was positive she'd put everything on the bed. She'd been tired, yes. She'd barely managed to get to bed before falling asleep. There are some things you do regularly and taking care of your gear was one of Donna's. Convincing herself it was just a dream, and she hadn't really placed her things on the other bed, but had just thrown everything on the floor, 
despite her habit of not doing things like this, Adana got ready for her shift. It was just a dream. It had to have been. There was no other explanation. As the guards were being dispatched to their duty stations, Donna was walking with one of her close friends. The weird dream was foremost in her mind, so she mentioned it to her friend. It went something like, Boy, did I have a weird dream last night, followed by what she could remember. The other guard looked at Donna and said, She'd had the same dream except she'd had it a few times in the past as well. The two compared the recollections, and they had both shared a dream of sorts. One of the male members of the guard detail, overhearing their conversation, said he'd had this dream as well. The main difference being his late-night visitor had his hood pulled up over his head, but the man's eyes were bright red. <clears throat> Had Donna told these two about her dream, say, the day before, you could understand how the other two might share her dream. But none of these three had told anyone about the weird dream they had until that moment. Kind of makes me wonder what the heck is going on at that Navy base down in Cuba. This next story is from Carl. Carl was a bike rider. A bicycle, not motorcycle. He lived about an hour's drive from Three Oaks, Michigan. One Saturday, his wife was at work, and Carl decided it was a great day for a ride. He got his bike mounted on his car, put on his gear, and then hit the road. Once he arrived in Three Oaks, Carl got on the saddle and started pedaling. A nice scenic place to cruise through. It was a small town, so there wasn't a lot of traffic to worry about. He pedaled along the town streets and out to the countryside. The roads were in pretty good shape, and this turned out to be a great day. Carl was pedaling along a country road with a few, if any, houses around. It was a mile or two between each building. The pavement had ended, and Carl was on a gravel road flanked by cornfields. He saw a minivan coming his way. The van passed him and slowed down. Then it made a U-turn, and it began pulling up alongside him. The passenger window rolled down, and Carl saw a man in her mid-twenties was sitting on the passenger seat. He came to a halt, and the van stopped right next to him. The driver leaned over the passenger side of the van and addressed Carl with what he saw, thought was a southern-sounding accent. He said, Hey, do you know David Christ?" The driver was a late 20s white man with a few inches of a goatee and he was wearing a baseball cap. Carl shook his head. Nope, don't know him. Well, the, div the driver didn't much seem to care for that answer. He said, you don't know him at all? <laughs> Carl gave the question a few seconds thought, but couldn't remember ever hearing of or meeting with anyone named David Christ. He assured the driver he had no idea who this Christ fellow was, and then he began pedaling along the country road once more. Uh, this has happened to me a few times when someone sees me and thinks I'm someone else. This is how I met David Scott. He thought I was someone else, and after we'd been talking for a bit, he, we decided we had something in common, and we stayed in contact for a while. What we had in common was Bigfoot and writing. <clears throat> David lives up in Canada now. Carl was convinced the mini driver, mini van driver, had mistaken him for somebody else who would be familiar with this David Christ, whoever he was. Uh, Carl followed whichever road he came to. 
He'd ridden the area a few times before, and he knew how to get back to town when he was finished with his ride. He didn't expect to ever see the minivan driver again. Uh, ten minutes later, and on a completely different road and heading in a different direction, Carl saw the minivan coming along the road ahead. As the van passed by, the driver was looking at Carl with a big smile on his face. Carl kind of waved back to say hi without slowing down. He thought maybe the two in the van were looking for some address they were not familiar with, and they were just driving up and down every road looking for the right place. They might have been a farmhouse where David Christ lived, and these two were looking for it. Carl continued taking a twisting, turning, meandering path, taking this road and then turning onto that, and heading north, south, east, and west. He was looking at the scenery and not really looking for the van, but he found it once more. There it was, coming along the road, right in front of him. As the bike was getting close to the van, the van driver stopped and once more rolled down his window. Carl pulled up alongside the van and looked at the driver, wondering where this encounter was going to lead. The driver stared at Carl for more than half a minute before asking, Do you know David Christ? As if he hadn't already asked Carl this question already. Carl began to suspect the driver was high or drunk or maybe just crazy. Carl said that no, he did not know anybody named David Christ. He hoped this was the end of the weirdness, and he pedaled away at a good clip, you know, trying not to look like he was afraid or anything, but he wanted to get away from that minivan. He looked up and down the road, and he realized that he was in the middle of nowhere. If anything was to happen, there was no one around to come to his aid. Carl decided his ride was over, and he started heading back to town and his car. He was coming to a fork in the road up ahead. The road to the left looked more like a goat trail than a road, and it was heading away from town. As Carl was almost to the junction, what did he see? Up ahead was the minivan. As the two got closer, Carl was getting ready to swing off the road and head off into the cornfields. The van was slowing down as Carl came close to it. The driver rolled down his window, but Carl had had enough. He put on a burst of speed and he zipped down the goat path to the left. There was no way the van could follow. It was just way too narrow. Carl rode the bumpy trail long enough to be well out of sight of the two in the van. He stopped and got off his bike and snuck back up the trail to see what the van was doing. The driver sat there for a few minutes and then he drove away. As soon as the van was out of sight, Carl went back to the road, turned towards town, and did his best to get there in record time. He got into town and made it to his car. He was looking in both directions as he put his bike in its rack on the trunk of his car. He was still looking back and forth as he got behind the wheel and pulled away, now on his way home and as far from the minivan as he could get. Once home, Carl got to wondering just who this David Christ was and why did the van driver think he should know him. Carl got on his computer and typed in the name. A David Christ of Knoxville, Tennessee, was accused of stabbing another man and punching a woman in the face at an East Knox County gas station. Christ then fled the scene and drove to his father's house. His father and a close friend had been in the car with him, but only Christ was accused of any injury. 
Later that day, David Christ's father called the Knox County Sheriff's Office to tell deputies that Christ wanted to surrender. Patrol officers arrived at Christ's home on Drennan Road and arrested him without incident at about 10.30 in the evening, according to the Sheriff's Office. Christ, 26, faces charges of aggravated assault and assault after authorities said he stabbed Anthony Crow, 21, in the side with a knife. After watching him pull into the gas station at the corner of Asheville Highway and Strawberry Plain Pike, his, uh, his assault charge was for punching the woman in the face. The three had carried on a long-running dispute, according to authorities, and I guess this was Christ's chance to get even. The photograph of David Christ looked exactly like the man driving the minivan. How is it a man currently being held with aggravated assault charges is out running around asking people if they know him? <clears throat> and how is it the van kept encountering Carl on all those back roads? As I was researching this story, I found another article from April 1996 that also involves a man named David Christ. Authorities thought they had finally broke a case, a murder case, of Scott Chris. In 1983, Scott Chris had died when he was shot multiple times by two men in a Baltimore suburb. In a plea bargain, two men told detectives that they had carried out the slaying for Christ's brother, a Pennsylvania man who was the sole beneficiary of the dead man's life insurance policy, and he stood to inherit the remainder of their late mother's estate. One year after arresting Christ on charges that he plotted the death of his only brother, police reopened a decades-old inquiry into the sudden death of Christ's father. Investigators say they took a hard look at the circumstances of his mother's death as well. Their investigation then led to the unexplained passing of her wealthy fiancé. As the investigation went on, it began to develop a truly bizarre story. Christ was also charged with trying to kill both his young daughters for the insurance policies he had taken out on their lives. Miranda was only four in 1990 when her father, who was an electrician, told her to grasp the shiny part of an exposed wire in the family kitchen. Christ then went into the basement and flipped on the breakers. The girl received severe burns to both her hands. Her life insurance policy had been for $142,000. Miranda was telling authorities about this while her father was sitting in jail. Diane Christ, Miranda's sister, was nine in 1993 when her father pushed her into the path of a pickup truck that he had hired a woman to steer down a lightly traveled road at a prearranged hour, according to the woman who was driving the truck. Diane survived because the woman driving the pickup lost her nerve and swerved at the last second. The sister was insured for $200,000. Christ received life in prison without parole. The Baltimore County, Maryland prosecutor said they are seeking an indictment on first-degree murder in the death of Scott Christ. They said David Christ could face the death penalty if found guilty. I could not find out if the extradition was ever carried out or not. Was the van driver asking about the stabbing in Knoxville or the multiple murders and attempted murders in Maryland and Pennsylvania? Did he just look like the man who stabbed somebody at a gas station, or was it him? Maybe the minivan driver was just a vision that only Carl saw. I can't find any more on this weird case. Well, there's something you don't hear every day. 
That's my phone telling me I've got a message. Here is a police report. The guys involved didn't want anything being credited to their, their names. It's what is known as a career-ending story. So, I'll call them Rick and Marty. Just try and figure out where I got those two names from. Rick and his partner Marty were responding to a motion alarm that had gone off in a doctor's office. The building had started out as office space and was converted to medical use. There was a pharmacy attached to it, and this made it an attractive target to some less savory types. A dispatch had said the alarm was on the second floor and the key holder was in route. The key holder was somebody who could unlock the doors even if they were not the owners of the property. The key holder arrived and he let the two officers into the building. When they walked to the stairs going to the second floor, the key holder said he didn't have the key to that door. The officers were going to have to use the elevator. In case this was a burglary, using the elevators was just not a good idea. Anyone sneaking around would hear the cab coming up, and most elevators ding when they arrive on the floor. Should there be an armed encounter, this could be a fatal mistake. Well, the officers had no choice, and so they entered the elevator. It opened on the second floor to a mostly black hallway. There was one overhead light that was at the far end of the hall. Rick and Marty started checking doors and soon found that all were locked. They worked away to the end of the hallway and there the last door was unlocked. Pushing the door open, the police officers entered what turned out to be an empty room. This office was not being used by the staff. From there, the two searched the waiting room and the examination rooms all along the corridor. Not finding anyone, Rick and Marty started back towards the elevator. As they stepped into the hallway, they noticed the light that had been on over the last office was now off. In its place, the light in front of the elevator was now on. Rick looked at Marty as if to ask, is this weird or what? They had to use the elevator to get back downstairs, so they were about to walk the hall when Marty said, Weren't all these doors closed when we came through here? Rick looked down the hall, and he could see that every door was now standing wide open. On the return trip to the elevator, the two officers had to check each office to see if the intruder had snuck in behind them. It seemed to take forever to check each room over. As Rick and Marty reached the last office, the main door slammed shut behind them. At this same time, both of their two-way radios began emitting static. At long last, they got to the elevator and headed back down to the street level. Once back downstairs, the two officers looked around for the key holder. He seemed to have wandered off. Rick contacted dispatch and requested a callback number for the key holder so he could advise him of what they had found, or rather not found. Dispatch stated that the key holder was still en route to the scene and was advising of an ETA of five minutes. Rick advised dispatch that they had already been out with the key holder and had cleared the building. A dispatch requested Rick give them a call right away. Rick called dispatch and she told him there was no way they could have been with the key holder. She stated that the alarm company had only made contact with one a few minutes ago. Eventually, the real key holder arrived on scene. Rick asked her about the man that had let them into the building, whether or not she knew who he was. She asked Rick to describe the man, and so he did. 
She stated that it sounded a lot like one of the doctors that used to lease the office on the second floor. The office was the last one at the end of the hallway, farthest from the elevator. She then said that the doctor had committed suicide at his summer home several days ago. Here is a story about a Girl Scout camping trip that went wrong. I'll call the young woman involved Carol. A Carol was a chaperone for Girl Scout camping trip when she was 16. She was going to accompany a group of 5 to 9 year olds on a trip into the woods. They'd be staying in some cabins and Carol was in charge of six young girls for the trip. On the first night in the cabin, Carol awoke to find one of her kids was in the process of walking out the door. Carol jumped out of bed and went after the wayward girl, thinking maybe she was en route to the bathrooms. Well, it turned out the girl was sleepwalking. Carol had left the cabin so fast she didn't have her shoes on. She was trying to coax the girl back into the cabin, when out of the darkness came the sound of something big moving through the trees. Thinking they were about to be attacked, Carol grabbed the kid and ran for the cabin. The young girl woke, screaming, not knowing where she was or what was going on. This woke all the girls in the cabin up as well. Well, nobody got any sleep that night. There is a belief that you shouldn't wake a sleepwalker. It is not dangerous to wake a sleepwalker. On the other hand, it might not be all that simple. The age-old belief that waking up a sleepwalker can cause a heart attack or shock or heart failure or even put him or her into a coma is just a myth. Gently waking them up at the moment is not dangerous. It's kind of like that whole nonsense about epileptics swallowing their tongue. It can't be done. Yet, I hear it all the time from armchair doctors. A little knowledge is dangerous. So, go to school, get a little knowledge, and live dangerously. What movie was that quote from? Lord Love a Duck. It came out in 1966, starring Roddy McDowell. The quote was not actually said in the movie, but it did show up in the credits. Well, back to Carol. On day two, Carol was helping out with a whole bunch, doing Girl Scout things. That afternoon, when Carol was walking the kids back from the latrine, the sleepwalker and another girl snuck away from the group. Carol realized they were gone, so she got some of the other chaperones to help look for the missing pair. It took them 15 minutes to track the two girls down. Once everybody was back at camp, the two young girls started telling scary stories about why they had snuck away, saying it was the kitty cow who lives in the woods. The sleepwalker was moved to another cabin. The second night, Carol woke up to find it had gotten very cold out. She got up and went around the cabin, closing all the windows. As she was closing the windows, Carol saw a light moving around through the trees. It looked like somebody carrying an old-style lantern. The, the light moved through the trees, coming closer to the cabin. It then turned and went through the trees just beyond the edge of the clearing. Carol tried to get a better look at who was using the lantern, but all she could see was light. She closed the shutters along with the windows. The light passed right by several of the windows, but all Carol could see was light coming in through the cracks. She wound up staying awake all night trying to see who was wandering around outside. The next morning, Carol told the counselors about the mysterious light. The counselors said it was probably just a ranger checking on the cabins. They said it was nothing to worry about. 
all the time of that night, the kids, or all that day, I should say, the kids spent their time scaring each other with stories about the kitty cow and nasty things it did. This led to some of the kids not wanting to leave the cabins, thinking the thing might get them. I tried looking up kitty cow legends. I could find only references to it in the World of Warcraft and an artist who uses that name. This doesn't really mean much. Some local legends don't travel far from their place of origins. Things like the wood booger. You don't hear about that up in the northwest or up around the Canada. That's more of a southern thing. Uh, that afternoon, Carol found out from one of the counselors that a bear had broken into another campsite and had eaten the camper's food. Never keep food at your campsite. Well, now Carol was worried about bears as well as the kitty cow. This did explain the rangers wandering around in the night. Maybe kitty cow was just a bear that somebody had misidentified. The third night, Carol stayed up all night, listening to music and looking out the windows. She was on guard against any bears coming into their campsite or the kitty cow sneaking in on them. She was also looking for that weird light to come back so she could see it was just a ranger and write off the mystery. <clears throat> At around 1.30 in the morning, the light moved through the trees once more following the same path. It began to pass the cabin when Carol heard one of the counselors yell, Who's there? The light immediately went out. A Carol yelled back that she had seen the light as well. She then said, What should I do? The counselor said to get all of her kids and bring them over to the next cabin, just in case. They all crammed into one cabin. As soon as the door was shut, a thunderstorm started. Between the thunder, the lightning, and the heavy rain, Carol didn't get any sleep for a third night. The next day, most of the adults thought the whole thing was just campfire stories and kids messing around. At the very worst, it was just a wild animal wandering around scaring the kids and some of the adults. Trying to maintain a facade of normalcy, the counselors arranged for a hike through the woods. Carol was paired up with another chaperone, and they got the kids out for a hike. It was foggy in the woods, and the kids were really strung out. Carol said it looked like a scene from the movie Silent Hills. All the excitement of the bear story and the lights in the woods and kitty cow had the kids claiming to see monsters behind every tree. All of the Girl Scouts were wearing matching ponchos, and it looked very bizarre as they walked through the fog. <clears throat> Carol was on edge, not having had enough sleep, and now the kids were all scared and they were scaring each other as well. Any sound was the kitty cow coming to kill and maim. A noise was heard in the fog. This led to someone screaming. All the kids began crying, some falling to the ground. A few ran back and forth trying to get away from this unseen monster. The other chaperone decided it was time to get out of there, so she took off running. Carol found herself all alone with a dozen kids all in a state of panic. In her sleep-addled mind, the kitty cow could be behind any tree waiting for the opportunity to grab her or one of the kids. Finding her inner hero, Carol grabbed a kid in each hand. She then began herding the others along the trail back to the camp. As she would get one or two going, others would need to be lifted from the ground and pushed along the trail. Carol had no idea how she did it, but she got all twelve kids back to the cabins. The other counselors and chaperones finally came out to help with the hysterical kids. The chaperone who had run away said 
she'd seen a bear, and that's why she ran. Great plan. Leave behind a dozen screaming kids as bear bait while you beat feet for safety. Yeah, you got to look out for yourself in a situation like that when you're the oldest person in charge. No one ever found out who'd been walking around the cabins with the lantern. The kitty cow never did show up to eat anyone. The noises in the woods could have been just about anything. Like Bigfoot, maybe? Uh, Carol does not want to go camping anymore to this day. Quick shout out, or whatever you want to call this, uh, some advertising for some of my friends who have businesses, let's say. Optica del Norte, 107 Calle del Norte. You should be able to see what you're looking at, so go get your eyes checked. If your skin looks like you've been mistreating it, maybe it's time you took better care. Contact Lourdes James at 956 seven two three three zero one nine and get some professional counseling on how to take care of your skin and if you hear a bump in the night and you think it just might be casper or maybe that creature from the horror movie contact the laredo paranormal research society you can get a hold of them at laredo paranormal at hotmail.com and They'll come by your house and see what's haunting you. Here's another police officer who saw something unexplainable. This time I'll call him George. George was sitting in a flat of a hill monitoring traffic. It was about 2 or 3 a.m. Where he was sitting was a well-known spot where a murder victim was found about 26 years ago. The murder was never solved. And some of the other officers refused to sit there, even though motorists were constantly doing 15 to 20 miles over the speed limit. If you get caught speeding, go ahead and make reference to their quota on speeding tickets. It will help you get you on your way quicker. While you're at it, mention how you pay their salary by paying taxes. This will endear the officer to you. If you really want some fun, try insulting them. Yep, all of these ideas are crazy, yet people will do them just about every time. As George was sitting there, he saw a shadow cross the back of his vehicle. He was coming up the passenger side. Almost immediately afterwards, the shadow came up to the driver's side of the unit and then crossed the front. It was completely dark in this area. The only light around the vehicle was coming from the moon. Thinking the worst might be about to happen, George turned on all of the lights. The alley lights lit up both sides and the headlights showed the front. The revolving blue and red lights worked to illuminate the rear of the vehicle. There was nothing there that could have made the shadow. George figured it was time to leave that area. Once he was down the road a ways and in a lit area, he stopped and got to thinking that the camera had automatically started recording the moment he hit the emergency lights. He, re he began to review the footage from the recorder. George could see the shadow come from the right rear side of his vehicle and cross to the left. There was no camera on the side of the unit, but the shadow appeared in the left front of the unit only for the image to suddenly go completely black. It looked like someone had put their hand over the lens. The camera did begin recording once more, but the view was now clear of any shadow beings. Uh, George has decided that he's not going to park in that one spot anymore. I read this next story on a few sites and found there's no way to determine if the teller was a male or a female. The wording could have been either, and the person never gave their name, so I'll go with Pat. If this is your story and I got the gender wrong, I'm sorry, but you could have put something in it to differentiate. 
You don't have to use your real name, but you can use a made-up name. And I really hate it when people go with these weird things like uh, Starchild123 or Flaming Rooster 77 It's like John Doe, John Doe, Bob. You don't have to make up these really weird names, do you? Yeah, anyway, I guess some people do. Makes their lives more colorful. Well, Pat grew up in a very quiet, upper-middle-class suburb, suburban neighborhood of a medium-sized town in Connecticut. To this day, she has no idea what it could have caused the following bizarre encounter to take place. As far as I could find out, this is the only time anything remotely like this has taken place. One night a few summers ago, Pat was 17, and she was supposed to go to dinner with her family. Well, Pat wasn't feeling all that good, and there was a show on that she really wanted to watch. So instead of going with the family, Pat elected to stay home and just rest. The family was fine with it, and Pat relaxed on the couch with the dogs, flipping through the channels, waiting for her show to start at nine. She had the remote sitting on the couch, and one of the big dogs, being a klutz he was, tried to jump up on Pat, knocking the remote to the floor in the process. Pat picked up the remote, but somehow, even though it had only fallen about a foot from the couch onto soft carpeting, it wouldn't work. Annoyed, Pat got up to manually change the channel back to the network that was the show that she wanted to see by using the cable box. As Pat started pushing the buttons on the cable box, the TV made an incredibly loud and weird sound as she could only describe as a whoosh, like a gust of wind, and then the TV shut off. A little bit pissed at this point, Pat just moved to one of the other rooms in the house with the TV. But the same thing happened. She turned on a different TV, heard a loud whoosh, and it abruptly shut off. This happened to yet another TV in another room. So Pat texted a friend who lived a few houses down to ask if her cable was being weird. The girl replied almost instantly that, no, everything was fine. Beyond confused and worried about how she would explain breaking every single TV in her house to her parents, Pat finally sat down in the kitchen and decided to watch the show on a tiny TV as a last result. This time it worked well for a few minutes. Then, all of a sudden, there was the whoosh sound and the TV abruptly shut off. At this point, Pat was so annoyed, she just retreated to her room, upstairs, relegating herself to avoid listening to any of the spoilers and hopefully catch the show later on when it came on again. Her room is in the top corner of the house, right under the main part of the attic, which they didn't use for much besides storage. Pat kept going downstairs to check the TVs, but still none of them would turn on. When she got back to her room, about 45 minutes later, inexplicably, she started hearing the same whoosh sound. This time, it was coming from the attic. Pat was beyond creeped out. There weren't even any old TVs up there, and certainly none that were plugged in, capable of turning on and off. She didn't know if anyone even put electrical connectors in their attics. It also wasn't all that windy outside, and it was the exact same sound as what the TVs were making. Pat was both scared and annoyed. She had no idea what was going on and wasn't feeling well again. She just wanted to go to sleep. Pulling the attic access door open, she went up into the attic, hoping to see what was making the sound and make it shut up so she could go to bed. Right in the center of the attic floor was a TV that Pat had never seen before in her life, turning on and off, making the whoosh sound as it clicked on and off. 
Pat freaked out. She was paralyzed with fear and confusion as she watched this TV, which wasn't even plugged in, turn on and off. She booked it back to her room, slammed the door, and had no idea what to do about this demon TV in the attic that was haunting the rest of the house. Finally, she called her parents, who thought she was tripping on acid and said they'd come home eventually, but she could call the cable company if she wanted. The whoosh continued for a good hour as Pat sat on her bed crying and convinced this was how she was going to die. Death by Demon TV. All of a sudden, it stopped. And Pat was even more freaked out than before. You know when it gets dead quiet, that's when the monster comes. She decided she would go back into the attic to see what was up with this possessed TV. As she crept up into the attic, Pat could see the old TV was just sitting there like your classic mid-90s huge TV, not making a sound. She wanted to bring it down to the living room so later she could show her parents, but it was way too heavy and dusty for her to carry down the steps. Pat was just happy it had stopped and headed downstairs to try the other TVs again. They all still refused to come on. Pat's mother arrived at home. Her father was following in another car since he had met them at the restaurant straight from work. Pat practically drugged her mother upstairs into the attic to ask her where the demon TV had come from. Pat and her mom got upstairs and into the attic to see the spot where the old TV had been was empty. To make her case even more shaky, all of the TVs in the house were now working just fine. She tried to relay everything that had happened to her mother, but she, as well as the rest of the family, were thinking either Pat was on something, crazy, or trying to pull some kind of a weird joke on them. The bizarre TV occurrence has never happened since that one night. Pat still has no idea what could have caused the TVs to all act up on the same one night, and why was there a strange old TV in the attic that vanished from sight. <clears throat> this next story comes from a security guard who went on to become a police officer, Walter. A few years back, before becoming an LEO, that's law enforcement officer, Walter worked as a security guard at an old abandoned hospital. His shift was 9P to 7A, what we shift workers would call the graveyard shift. A year earlier, the hospital owners had built a brand new facility to replace their five-story 1900s building. When the employees and patients left, they left everything in place. The same thing happened when Old Mercy Hospital closed and New Mercy opened. A ton of stuff, and I'm not exaggerating, was left in the abandoned building. To Walter, it looked like the people just disappeared in a hurry. There were partially filled coffee cups, uniforms hanging on coat racks. There were wheelchairs in the halls. Everything was as it was, with a good coating of dust. Walter was always a third shift kind of person. He didn't get night jitters or scare easily. This place, however, could do it to the best of them. Every night Walter would walk through the halls that were supposed to be empty and unused. On occasion, just for fun, he'd wheel himself along the corridors in one of the wheelchairs, still sitting around on the various floors. Yeah, been there, done that. <laughs> Every night, Walter would end up having to close doors and relock them. He would walk one floor, move to the next, and continue on. He got a little shaky when an hour after already walking the length of the hallway, Walter would turn off the same lights and close the same doors. He was thinking maybe somebody was sneaking in behind him and turning the lights on or unlocking doors. 
on several nights while standing still. He would hear footsteps on the floor above him. This might be accompanied by doors opening and closing, elevators moving from floor to floor, phones ringing, and nurse-like calls coming in, those little lights over the doors flashing on and off. There were only three times he got that I-hate-this-stuff feeling. The first time, Walter was checking offices on the fourth floor. There was a light on in one of the locked hallways. This hallway hadn't been renovated since the place was built, short of having electricity added, so everything looked like the 1920s. Walter unlocked the door, flipped the lights off, stepped out the door, relocked it, and turned to leave. Behind him, he heard the light switch click. Through the frosted glass, he could see the lights were back on. Walter left the lights on and walked away, hoping there was just something wrong with the switch. The second time, Walter was riding an elevator up to the fifth floor. As he rose up the shaft, he could hear what sounded like laughter and talking coming from the floors above. It traveled down the elevator shaft, getting louder as he got higher. As the cab arrived on the fifth floor, the sounds were right there outside the door. The door pulled open to reveal... nothing. No one was there to have made all the sounds he had heard as the elevator was moving. All the lights on the floor were on. There was no way he might have missed someone. The laughter and the talking had continued right up until the doors opened. Walter checked every corner anyone might have been hiding in, but there was no one there. The third and worst of all was just an average night. Walter was on the lower levels, locking a door in the corridor. The door had a glass middle, but on the back side it was covered with white tape. The room it led to was dark, and the hallway a few feet behind him was partially lit. This caused the glass to act like a mirror. As he turned the key in the lock and the reflection of the glass, he saw somebody walk past him. Walter swung around to see who was in the hallway with him. There was no one there. He moved up and down the corridor, looking in every place a person could be, only to find out what he already knew. There was not another living soul in the building. He finally got around to asking the other guards who worked the day shift and the evening shift if they'd had any weird experiences as well. Some said that they had seen a group of nuns walking along the third floor hallway heading to the chapel. After a year of working at this weird, haunted hospital, Walter joined the local police force. These next few stories are from my book, Paranormal Laredo. David was driving home after having drank a few beers. He was lightheaded, but he was not drunk. As he passed the cemeteries, he turned north onto McPherson, and that was when something hit his pickup, causing it to bounce. He looked in his side mirror to see if maybe he'd hit something. Then he glanced in the rear view mirror. In the bed of his truck sat a huge creature. It looked like a giant bat, like the thing from the movie Jeepers Creepers. The skin was shiny black, and its elbows were touching both sides across the bed of the truck. A David screamed and hit the brakes. This caused the creature to slide forward and hit the back window of the cab. The creature was now just inches from the back of his head. The sudden impact caused him to hit the gas. The acceleration made the creature tumble backwards and bounce over the tailgate. David did his best to get as far away as he could without breaking too many speed laws. 
One person seeing an odd creature might be explained away as overactive imagination. However, Judith lived on the south side of town on Highway 83 South. Her and her friend Daniela were sitting outside her home on the tailgate of a pickup truck. Daniela was facing over Judith's shoulder towards a tree in the yard, but she had her eyes closed while she was laughing. Judith caught movement from the corner of her eye. She stopped laughing and said, Did you see that? Up in the tree was a huge creature. It was all black and its skin was hairless and shiny like it was made out of latex. It had huge wings like a bat. The shape brought to mind the thing from the movie Jeepers Creepers. Judith's mouth just dropped open and all she could say was, Jeepers Creepers? The creature flew right over the two and landed in a tree across the street from them. Daniela ran to the cab of her truck, but Judith was in some sort of shock and she couldn't move. Daniela had to come help Judith off the tailgate. They walked quickly to the door, and once Judith was inside, Daniela drove away. Okay, how about a few more sightings of this mysterious creature? In 2012, on the south side of Laredo, somewhere around Cielito Lindo neighborhood, a witness saw a huge bat-like creature flying overhead. It was too far away to get a real good look, but it definitely was not a bird. It had bat wings, and it flew in that same swooping pattern a bat uses. The creature flew away into the distance. In 2016, someone saw a giant bat flying over the Laredo College South Campus, which is west-northwest from Cielito Lindo. This took place right at sundown. Once again, the witness was certain this was not a bird. It was huge, black, and bat-shaped. There have also been sightings of the Jeepers Creepers monster along Espejo Molina running between Rio Bravo and El Ceniso. People would be driving along the road late at night, and standing in the brush just off the side of the road would be this seven-foot-tall creature that looked like the monster from the movie. They said it was very much bat-like, it had black shiny skin, and it just stood there and watched them as they drove by. None of the people that told me these stories knew each other or of any of the other reports having been made. It makes me wonder what kind of a giant creature do we have flying around Laredo, and how many people have seen it that have never told anyone because they were afraid folks would think they were nuts. If you'd like to get a copy of the book I wrote, Paranormal Laredo, you can find it at the Organic Man Coffee Trike on McPherson, the Phoenix Bookstore on Victoria, or at Amazon.com. Hey, it's Halloween. It's time to read scary stories. And... Christmas is just around the corner and books make good gifts. Till next time, this is Chris James for Strange Things. Are you, are you coming to the tree With a strong upper man, the same murder three Strange things that happen here, no stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree